My experience with Eritrean artists has been very inspiring. I came to Eritrea in 1994 to work on a book project, Africa, Women's Art, Women's Lives, and in the process met young Eritrean artists who had spent more than half of their lives in a war zone fighting for their freedom and at the same time learning how to paint, learning how to draw. As I gradually got to know these artists, I really admired their discipline, their courage, and their commitment. And indeed, I found two very special women, Elsa Jacob and Terhas Yasso, who became Chapter 7, Eritrean Artist Fighters and New Visions. These two women inspired me, and learning about them and their personal lives and their participation in the war effort has been a fascinating chapter in this book and in my own life. Eritrea is a small nation of three million people located in northeast Africa. Eritrea borders the Red Sea and has two major ports, Massawa and Asab. The terrain varies from the highlands and altitudes of over 7,000 feet to below sea level. Eritrea's food supply is predominantly dependent on the rainfall. Eritrea is composed of nine major ethnic groups that live in villages with distinct languages and traditions. These peoples are portrayed in an embroidery created by a fighter in the war zone, Burhani Zaid. In her wonderfully detailed portraits, we see the traditional clothes, jewelry, and body adornments of the different peoples. These groups are Tigrinya Nara, Tigre Haidareb, Berlin Afar, Saho Kunama, and Rashida. For 50 years, 1889 to 1941, Italy colonized Eritrea. Eritrea was liberated by the British and then federated to Ethiopia after the Second World War. Ethiopia began to be very aggressive toward Eritrea and oppressed the peoples. Gradually, Resistance was formed, and the Eritrean People's Liberation Front organized and led the resistance. And this eventually led to a 30-year war. During this war, 30 to 40 percent of the fighters were women. They developed a strong camaraderie and resistance. Ethiopia's military government, the Derg, was well supplied with armaments by Russia, and these weapons turned against Eritrea eventually became the very weapons that Eritreans captured and then used to win the war in May 1991. When uh, I was in the field, I was participating in the front lines. In fact, we were fighting just like the men. And we are not sometimes equally uh, powerful, you know, physically with the men. But all our efforts were just to come online with the men. And there are a lot of uh, heroic women. The name of uh, my poster is A Woman Hero. And I did that in 1984 when I just came back from the front lines. And what I want to say in that poster was that the women are not soft. They are powerful. So that's the right reality that the women were fighting in the front lines as, just as the men do. I tried to give her an expression of uh, being ready to give her life, to work to the last drop of her blood. And she's sweating, uh, she's holding her collection of the other hand is holding the grenade. Yeah, now there are tanks behind the woman. These tanks are working for the EPLF. They are our tanks. The Dirk brought them from Russia. And we took them from the Dirk and these bags for the bullets even is the shoes from the dead soldiers. So this place is uh, the trench of the enemy. This hero woman came from 
maybe from the behind mountains and up to the trenches of the enemy. So this is about the end of the battle, of this special battle. Mangusta Haile Mariam, the Ethiopian military leader, announced to all the world that this is the last war in Eritrea because he was really uh, confident that we will be all destroyed. But it was not like that. Against all odds, in May 1991, Eritreans finally won their hard-earned peace from their Ethiopian neighbor, and their long ordeal and suffering finally ended. When I first visited Eritrea in 1994, one of the first artists I met was Elsa Jakob, and I was thrilled to learn about her past, how she'd been an artist fighter, and now to return and visit once again at her mother's home and to meet her family, her growing children, and to realize that a third child was on the way. It was another opportunity to see her work, the work that she had done during the war, as well as to catch up with some of her new paintings since we first met several years before. I do it when they were chatting with somebody unknowingly. This is one of the sketches which we were making with him. So you were really getting into muscle structure and anatomy yeah, and proportion. Yeah. Very nice. We had an uh, art magazine. We were trying to make art stories. So this would be a series of series, series yeah, series, yes. Yeah. And these were published during the war? Yeah, it was they published. They were published in, for, for the front, and they were published in Tigrinya, or how many in languages? Tigrinya. Just in Tigrinya? Yeah, it was in Tigrinya. Oh, yeah. In 1984, there was a very bad famine in Eritrea drought so i had an idea of having a painting of this uh, bad uh, situation in eritrea well we were not as starving as them um, because we had to fight but we were sharing our food also mm -hmm. uh, a mother uh, breastfeeding her child uh, what she's doing is she wants to breastfeed her child but it has no milk mm -hmm. so the child is crying and she's trying but she's you know, desperate. Yeah. Charles desperate. Mm. This is how I wanted to express the famine, the drought in Eritrea. This is a militiaman. I did this painting uh, in 1986. Yeah, and militia means the armed part of the people. Uh, this is one of the people who were armed around Sahel. And he's holding a Kalashnikov? Yeah, he's holding a Kalashnikov. I like his intense eyes, his strong mm. eyes. Since the end of the war, I have been here in Asmara, and I'm working in the art school where we teach uh, to be teachers for elementary schools. And in my part time, I do some paintings. I have also a camel and a fighter. He is uh, tying a big box of uh, equipments to be loaded over the camel to go to the front lines. So the camels were working on the front lines, helping the fighters to carry the ammunition and so. My mother's visit to our death, I was in our death, and uh, she came from Asmara to our death. It's a long way by camel, three days ride. And she was hiding from the enemy so that they cannot know that she is visiting me because I'm a fighter. You know, it's dangerous. But she came and we were together, we were happy for three weeks. So uh, she was on the camel and she was crying. Well, she was crying, but I was not. Because I was, I think, almost ready for everything, but she was not. So. I have the memory of that situation of my mother and me being separated. Uh, I painted uh, my son's painting in 1994, but it's uh, from back when he was uh, six months old, and roses around him, and uh, white rose over the corner of the painting that 
my child was looking that white rose just to show a bright future, just hoping a bright future for my child. In 1995, I felt so pleased to be invited to return to Eritrea by the Ministry of Education and to present a workshop at the Ismara School of Art. In this image created by Elsa, a self-portrait, we see her looking very proud and holding in her hand a sculpture tool and near her are paintbrushes and a palette. She looked toward the future with the hope of becoming a very good artist and this is her dream. I was looking forward to seeing Terha Siaso. She and Elsa had trained together in the war zone. Terha lived in a courtyard with seven other families Terhas's children were born in the war zone, and they lived together and slept in the same room where Terhas painted. Her mother also had a room and her sisters in this complex. As I walked through, many memories came back from the past, and one of the very special things that happens is the way you're greeted. Eritreans have a wonderful way of greeting each other, a kiss three times rotated from cheek to cheek. And I love this feeling of warmth and the touch of people who had become my friends. The mother's ritual of preparing coffee for visitors is standard, and I loved being in the room to smell the fresh ground coffee beans and the pouring of the water and the pouring of the fresh coffee into small cups. It was only after this experience of drinking the coffee and finding out how each other's health was that we could really begin to look at the artwork. I was surprised how nicely Terhas had prepared her room where she and her daughters normally slept. All of her work was up on the walls and I could see a retrospective of many of her war images and some of her more recent paintings during this past year or two and the vast difference in the emotional content of the works. Yes. Almost all the artist fighters did at least one or more drawings or paintings with camels. I soon understood why. Terhas told me, camels are like fighters. They're like our brothers or sisters, carrying our food supplies all night long from one combat zone to another. They can go seven days without water or food, and they don't make noise or bray like donkeys. But she also warned me, camels can be naughty. She explained how during the war, an oil painting sack or a flour sack was cut open and prepared with a base of sugar and flour. We had no other choices. I started in, uh, art by voluntary in uh, Asmara when I was a child. After when I go to uh, EPLF, I continue this uh, working. Later, she was trained to fight. And shortly after that, when the culture unit was formed, she was selected to also train as an artist. One of her early paintings is about a soldier cooking in the war zone, and it's typical of many of her works from this period. We train in the field because we learn in the field. Haile uh, Walde Mikael and Waldo Ibrahim Adenai, there was their like teachers. And we work hard because in the field, all people, all fighters, it works hard. In the field, I got marriage and I have two daughters, Martha and Gannett. In contrast to her happy portrait of Martha, Terhas creates a drawing of a child that is crying that is a victim of war. Mothers and children are a frequent theme of Terhas' work. In this oil painting, we see a mother holding her child against a background of desolation. The surrounding landscape reinforces this feeling as it seems barren and filled with rocks. Some of Terhas's watercolor paintings were made into posters as this one, Fighter. In it, the symbolic image is expressionistic in style, but composed to convey the political message, I'll honor your pledge, which is written in Tigrinya and English. In this charcoal drawing of an Ethiopian woman, 
Sarah has has much pleasure in drawing her smile and in portraying the jewelry and some of her customs and traditions. During the past year, Terhas began to venture into the marketplace and to use some of the themes that she saw there as subjects for her paintings. In this one, Animal Transport, we see a donkey that's used to carry food products to people's homes. When Terhas attended the workshop, she created this large pen and ink drawing of a woman grinding corn. She explained to me that the woman's hairstyle was split, that is, one part was tigrinha and the other part tigre, because this woman had to contain within herself the spirit of all the different peoples so that national unity would prevail. So now I work in this curriculum department, Ministry of Education, in national uh, pedagogy. I prepare books and illustration for academic books. And now we are using my computer. In which language is this? This is Tigre. In Tigre. So this is the first uh, Tigre language. Right, so many, many pages go into making a book. And, and this is Saho, this is Arabic. And Arabic. Yeah. So these are some of the wonderful illustrations that yes. you have. Yes. So you're continually busy producing this work. I mean, just um, uh, you know, from every single letter of the alphabet and every language. We prepare uh, to all the curriculum books, from elementary and secondary books. Once again, the camel is a subject for Terhas and these murals at an elementary school, as well as children playing with balloons and other subjects and themes. Terhas, this is a kindergarten here, and they're learning English. I mean, look, the alphabet, the English alphabet. Yes, this is kindergarten school, uh, schools for children. And they learn by joking. And by playing? Show, by playing and to see artwork. So you have bells and scissors and, and, and yes, all these... bags and uh, pencils. And you painted this during your lunch time? Yes, at 12 or 2 o'clock. It's wonderful and we see the kids enjoying it. We yes. see the children enjoying it. Yes. And that's great. Yeah, because I love children. So that's why I paint for them. Mikel Adonai joined the Eritrean People's Liberation Front at age 14. Soon afterwards, he entered the cultural unit, where he was trained by his brother Burhani as one of the artists. He enjoyed his work, and this has become an important part of his life. And I see the beginning of the painting and all the detail and the patience that you have with doing your work. I don't know what will be the outcome of this painting, but I'm trying hard to, to express my inner feeling about this uh, drought of 1984. And in here, I see a lot of your paintings that have been made into posters. Tell me what this one says. And the second one is, uh, it's time for Women's Day. You have it in three languages. Yeah. You have it in Arabic, Arabic Tirunya, and, and English. English, yeah. So you can see clearly that she's a fighter with a you can say courageous facial expression, looking forward. Mikhail, you live in Ismara, but here I see rural life. It looks to me village life. He's a nomad. Mm -hmm. I try to mingle together the nomad and the camel because camel at the lowlands is the backbone of their daily life. When it comes to style, you see, I can say that I'm in the process of searching myself. I tried everything, sometimes figurative, Sometimes you see more or less abstract. You see, the history of Eritrean people is a history of uh, successive colonial aggression and uh, centuries long popular resistance, also. Well, uh, the title of this painting is Hard Times. 
the history of Ukrainian people is uh, drought, uh, bombardment, even the devastation of the national and uh, cultural uh, identity of the, the, the people. So when I, I start to paint something, most of the time this kind of uh, images process my, my, my mind. The second anniversary for the liberation of Masawa. Masawa is a poor city and uh, it was really a turning point for the Eritrean People's Liberation Front to liberate this poor city. A man with a, a white dove, just the peace. There are uh, a lot of people at the background. They are uh, describing their, their happiness, of, uh, and that happiness is uh, the, the happiness of all Eritrean people. This is uh, one of uh, my happy paintings. I am trying to express liberation through the unification of two separate families. This man is a fighter and he's greeting his families. And without uh, this liberation comes through, he cannot able to uh, find his family, vice versa. Also, his family cannot find him without this liberation comes through. And uh, you see, we artists at the APLF, we have always an obligation. And the obligation was just to, to, to fight with our uh, pencils and brushes to mobilize the people, to promote the national cause, you see. It was good to return to the Asmara School of Art and to meet with Burhani Adonai once again, who was the director, and my good friend Waldo Afwerke, who was one of the faculty people there at this time. Both had been fighters in the war zone, and now I was to see their new work and to learn about their new experiences. I joined the field uh, in 1974, in uh, December. When, uh, when I joined to the, to the, to the field, th there was a mission, and that mission was uh, to, to get rid of our enemy from our uh, motherland, uh, and uh, gain our independence and live in peace and uh, get progress. And fortunately, I came to be one of the luckiest one to see the, the, the Freedom Day. You have done some wonderful paintings of your own. And two paintings that we have are one uh, showing a woman and a camel and a man, and they're plowing. Uh, the name of that painting is uh, Plowing with Camel. And that uh, painting uh, depicts uh, not only men, but women also labor. So it shows the cooperation between man and woman. And then there's another painting that we have that shows a family in the Sahel. Well, uh, that painting shows uh, a family, family of uh, Sahel region in northern part of Eritrea. They, they are sharing ideas among themselves. The woman, her husband, a daughter of them is fetching water, and there is uh, a fire pot. That stove is a remaining of uh, enemy bomb. Oh, so we use everything. Right. Even, even for, uh, the, the, the material which the enemy uh, used uh, to, to kill us. Brian, in 1995, I was very pleased to be invited to teach here, to present a workshop. Um, and do you feel that it was good for the students? Well, uh, everybody has his own way of expression. And you, as an uh, experienced uh, art professor, you have shared to, 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 to the student how to visualize things uh, and uh, to turn them to abstract. One of the projects that I offered was symbolic self-portrait, and we worked with pen and ink. Elsa also attended the workshop, and two of the images that she created are coffee and the bride. In her pen and ink drawing of the traditional coffee ceremony, we see a woman pouring slowly the coffee that has been brewed in a clay pot. The drops are delicious, each and every one to be savored in a small cup. Oh, 
I sense Elsa's drawing of the bride is about herself as a young bride after the war and the pleasure she had from wearing the traditional garments and jewelry for the wedding ceremony. What was special about the pen and ink drawings was that I could Xerox them and bring them back to America and share them with my students at Southern Oregon University. They were surprised to see the wonderful technical skills of Africans and more than that, to learn about their lives through these drawings. These images were certainly different than those portrayed by our popular media and thereafter Africa would never seem so far away to Oregon students again. It was fun to see how Africans saw me, and while I was presenting the workshop, it was amazing to realize that I was being sketched. This caricature was created by Haile Mikel Ogbu. Haile, tell me about the drawing that you did in my workshop in 1995. I see you have it up in your house. Yeah, I like it. Uh, it is a priest. Why was the priest important for you? I, I like the strokes of his face and the composition and this one and the other. So I choose this uh, one uh, to similar with your technique. Now tell me about the painting underneath. Uh, it looks like a young man, so we go from old man to young man. Who is this young man? What has happened to him? He was my friend. He was the fighter in the film. Uh, he was one of the cultural group of the APLF. He died in 1990, and he was a great musician. Also, he was a comedian, uh, and he played football, and he was my best friend. So I won't remember, and I painted this, uh, his uh, portrait in the field. Just remember. During the early war years, men and women lived and fought together, but sexual relations were strictly forbidden. Since the war was long, and approximately 30 to 40 percent of the combatants were women, policy changed as life had to take on some aspects of normalcy or morale would have suffered. Gradually, intimate relations formed, and by 1981, there were mass marriages. Haile Mikel Obu and Ngusi, two people who knew Haile Waldi Mikel. Can you tell me about him? He was the best artist, and he was a father also. When I met uh, first Haile, he talked about art, how to use or how to uh, practice the art, how to paint, how to uh, sketch with pencils. How old were you when you met Haile Wong Mikel in the field? I met Haile, uh, I think, 15 years old. He teached me until 1983. Is that when he died? Yeah. I want to see always his face. To honor him? Yeah. So this is uh, really his face. Very young man really died. Yeah, he was. That is his wife. He didn't finish it, this one. So I want to remember these three parts. This is his guitar. And the flowers for to remember, for good to see for him. Harley Wald Mikkel was not only a fantastic teacher, but his own paintings were an inspiration to his students. They varied in style from detailed realism to passionate expressionism. In handicrafts, a woman is calmly absorbed in creating a large injera basket as her hands are graphically portrayed shaping the straw. Injera is their basic food staple, a kind of pancake-like bread. Hollywood Mikkel's expressionistic painting, Woman's Oppression, is symbolic, painted with tempera on canvas. The brush strokes of flaming warm tones dominate the woman's form 
as she rises from the midst of destruction and breaks free of the iron chains that mentally and physically bind her. This powerful image seems more than a call to arms, that is, it encourages women's participation in the liberation struggle. It also refers to the centuries of women's oppression under patriarchy. Laini Blata was born in Asmara and joined the Eritrean People's Liberation Front when he was only 14 years. He also joined the culture unit and had a chance to train as an artist, but he has another talent. He's also a wonderful musician. Tell me about the painting with the man reading. What is that about? This uh, picture tells about uh, a militia. Uh, in the participating in the literacy campaign. In the 1983, uh, the PLF uh, had a plan to mobilize or to teach the people. So uh, me and the other members of the Revolution School were, uh, um, our duty was to teach these people how to read and how to write. And then up above, there's another painting with a child learning to write. It almost looks like it could be a portrait of you because you were so young. Schools became a very important component of the liberation movement because most of them had been destroyed during the war and during colonialism, there hardly were any. Now the opportunity to attend school was happening for many of them in a war zone. And then a different painting, very different. Um, it's about village women doing some traditional hair braiding. Yeah. Besides an artist, I have also to study the cultural activities of the people. So one of these is braiding of hair, traditional, of the Tigrinya nationality. Markets are a wonderful place to learn to experience the country because you see all kinds of people going and coming, buying and selling, and they reflect the pulse of the nation, the pulse of what's happening right here and now. I never expected that I would find an artist in the marketplace, and when I walked further into the craft section, there amongst the stalls, I found Kiros Abebe. In his recent painting, The New or Coming World, he talks about the conflict between East and West. He tries to symbolize this through the sharp angles that refer to nuclear armaments and to war and anger, and also the opposite, how conflict has to be resolved, and through the circular shape he is symbolizing peace. Kiros likes to work with symbolic ideas, and in thinking of the future, he realizes that man's technical prowess has excelled beyond his ability to use his brain to resolve just common, ordinary problems, and somehow the conflict between technology and human beings has also got to resolve. More recently, Kiros has painted an image from the war in a very different style of painting, somewhat romantic, of a woman fighter. Abraham Mogos joined the Eritrean People's Liberation Front in 1977, and this is reflected in his work. I was here, the fighter's tank, but already my comrades or the fighters at that time is already dead with these tanks. So this uh, painting, uh, especially for me, is very appreciative. Uh, and uh, this is the anniversary, first anniversary in Masawa. Mogos remembers times of calm even during the war, when simple tasks became very special, as this woman who is mending a shirt. In the background are two fighters who are now playing musical instruments, and these are very precious moments in the midst of this horrible long war. 
Abraham told me that he had studied art with Haile Wold Mikhail but never worked with pen and ink before. And he did a fantastic job, just rich, rich details in three drawings. In his self-portrait, we see his paintbrush in his hand, but down below, the evil, the evil of the snake and the difficulties of the war and the intenseness of his eyes and face as he hopes to continue painting and creating in the present and the future. In this cry of anguish, which she calls peace, it's the yearning for peace, for liberation, just the very feelings that pulled him through the war and the difficulties and the fighting and the action. And he recaptures this through this wonderful monumental drawing of the hand, the face, the tragedy of war, the looking and hoping for peace. In the drawing of his Mara, he includes the church and some of the details of the city itself, and a soldier coming back to his family, the child, and having to put together his life, the difference between the war and now coming to peace and to rebuilding relationships. <laughs> I uh, coming from the uh, poor family. It's, my family is to living in the village. My history is, uh, comes from the, uh, the uh, village country uh, or village sides. So especially this uh, place is to see from the life of uh, uh, peasants. I like these uh, movements or landscapes. Waldo Afwerki was actually born in Ethiopia in 1955 and had a chance to attend the National Fine Arts School in Addis Ababa for three years. His experiences were very useful in the war because he was one of the teachers of the culture unit and many people worked with him and he trained a whole generation of young artists along with Berhane and Haile Wald Mikkel. It's interesting to see your new work since the war, since liberation, but also to realize you're still doing some things that are sad sometimes, that you're dealing with a pregnant woman. Can you tell us a little about her life? This uh, Eritrean uh, life. Eritrean life? Yes. This uh, pregnant uh, or uh, hard work. This easy, this Eritrean she's woman. She's still working hard. Yes. She's carrying wood, she's carrying water. Yes, water uh, and uh, wood and uh, anything. And here we have a. Um, Man playing the Abangala. During the war, most of Waldo's work was political and very realistic, and now he's begun to explore technically, including styles such as expressionism, using very somber colors or very bright colors. I'm uh, very happy. And then the Nada Man, is he going to the market? Nara, Mans, and uh, Kunama, the same. Uh, Very close in traditions? Uh, yes. Same traditions? Yes, the same uh, clothes, the same shoes, the same anything. Uh, no different. This painting is very typical of the semi-nomadic peoples and how they herd animals and always seek for water and grazing areas. The man will often carry the stick across his shoulders, which is very helpful to guide his animals and to ward off any predators. It was very interesting to see how Waldo's paintings paralleled real life as this shepherd walks across the landscape. This one was uh, painted during the war, 1985. It's a Balkan girl. I portrayed uh, her as a model. Then I finished it uh, with charcoal. I, will, I appreciated her uh, faces uh, and uh, her cheeks, her clothes, and her hairdress. I was so interested. And I sketched it my pencil. Then when I go back to my studio, I finished it with charcoal. When I joined to the field, um, 
I get some oil colors and pastels in the field when we liberated Masawa in 1977. Then uh, I make some arts to do since I get some uh, colors from the soldiers of the enemy. Then from that time when I was wounded in the sixth offensive my leg, I go to the art section in the cultural group. And from 1983, I was the archivist of the artworks which were done in the field. And still they are with me, the artworks, uh, since I am the head of the archivists, the head of the archives. All the artworks of the fields are with me in the National Museum. I painted uh, preparing for war uh, 1990s, oil color on canvas. How to prepare a fighter mending sandals, so checking his uh, bullets, everything. So I painted this uh, preparing for war uh, during the eve of liberation when we went to Masawa. It was painted in 1990. This workshop was established by Musi Aska Dom just recently for disabled artist fighters. This is uh, the reunion yeah. of a fighter and a mother. Yeah. Um, and um, he painted it just after liberation. Yeah. Right after liberation. Yeah. Oh. Uh, the fighters come from the field uh, meet all together with the uh, parents, families, uh, together come in shame to uh, his mother. Because it is uh, explained about the freedom, this day of freedom. All uh, people uh, happy, all fighters happy, all. Uh, many Eastern children is uh, homeless. His mother is dead, uh, father is dead, gone on the field, but no parent. By this case, is this no home? No, he's sleeping on the street. Another uh, spell is for a uh, uh, child. It is under each uh, girl, but this expression is the work hard, work hard. Yes. The space is very tired. The uh, yeah, tired. Can you tell me about this painting about the Kunama people? How you came to paint it? Yeah, uh, this painting is when I was uh, on the field. I saw the Kunama dance. Kunama people. I like Kunama dance because it is uh, special for uh, Eastern dance. When I was on the field, I saw, but I am not uh, paid. Uh, on mind, it is the observe the Kunama. You remember that? Yeah, you mean, remember the experience? Yes, yes. I do this painting. It's a very happy, joyous yeah, painting. Yeah, yeah. All my painting is expression and anatomy. Anatomy? Uh, yeah. And feeling. Yeah, it's just my Your feeling. Feelings. Yeah. Abrahead's husband, Danny Davla, created this painting recently of a woman playing the kiros, just like Abrahead. The kiros is a traditional instrument that is normally played by men. I first met Danny and Abrahead in 1994, and I was so glad to be visiting them once again in Ismara. Their life had changed for the better, and they had their own house now, and I was going to meet Danny and his mother, who is now living with them. Hi, baby. Welcome. Come on in, Danny. 
it was wonderful to be with Danny and Abrahead again and to greet Abrahead and to see her dressed informally. <laughs> I was invited for lunch and it was very special to sit with them and we began with the traditional hand washing before the meal would be served. The meal was based around the Eritrean staple which is injera, a sourdough bread. This time it was served in long strips which we put on our plates and then unrolled and used as a scoop for the wonderful spicy lentil and meat dishes. Danny was a wonderful storyteller and I enjoyed watching him as he described meeting Abrahet in the war zone and how she began to first learn playing the traditional Kiros instrument. She could play. She was part of the, those people who were assigned. Danny, the contrast in your paintings is amazing to me because they were both done in 1993 and yet one is a memory of the war and the bombs and the terror where the other is just a, a whole different philosophy. So. You know, as any fighter, I'm glad I'm an artist fighter because I could express my, my, some of my thoughts on painting so that other people can see. Mm -hmm. But pay, uh, fighters are living two lives. One is the past life, they are still living in that. They could never forget what they have passed through, the people they have seen, the martyrs, the people that have burned, the hardships, the love, everything. The fighters, the few fighter artists that are still alive are the only witnesses, eyewitnesses, to keep up the history. So I am trying that what the people have passed through. For instance, here, at the background, there is a village burning by the night, night bombardment of the enemy. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the disastrous things that happened to our people. And this woman is snatching away her only very valuable uh, position she has from everything, her baby. Mm -hmm. Everything is burned there. This painting I did in 93, like you see there, uh, the caption there. And uh, what I want to show here is the age of a person. This is Mother Nature, and there is this nude woman here to represent mother nature and the child is born uh, from the womb here and the small world of his own is also born with him and he grows playing with this world in the different colors of life the way he wants to use his world and this is of course what we call the dangerous age when he thinks the world is under his feet but actually what he's treading on is the breast of his mother but then maturity comes and he starts taking care of his world. And as he grows old, the world slips away slowly out of his hand. So this is just a symbolism of the age of a person. These two certificates that you see on the left and right are uh, demobilization certificates for my wife and myself. And uh, I am putting them on this composition with this painting and that uh, basketry on the top for a special meaning that I thought. The basketry shows the culture under which we fought. The cultural mentality had, had I think, a great impact on winning the unwinnable war. And the painting itself shows this fighter burning himself to put Eritrea out of the fire. What you see there, the green thing that he's holding up is the map of Eritrea as a symbolic map, and the baby as a symbol of the next generation and the bird, the peace in the greenness that the fighter is dying for. This painting uh, tells about uh, what we fought for. We fought for not only to free our country, but after freedom, what are we going to do? So the first thing was freedom. So that's why this symbol here, freedom. And then, but what after freedom? After freedom, we have to ensure peace. If there is no peace after freedom, if there is tribal war, if there is religion war, or, or if there is any other kind of upheavals, then what's freedom was for? So we had to ensure freedom. Until now, we have successfully done these two. 
Now what we are working on is how to secure constitution, constitutional peace or freedom. It was always a pleasure to see the many changes that were occurring for the artists as I kept on coming back to Eritrea. First I noticed there was an Eritrean Fine Arts Association with 99 members. They were so well organized that they began to want to paint murals and were actually doing so. We caught them in the process of finishing up a very extensive mural in Asmara and they had plans to do others. There were five sections to the murals, and some of the themes that they covered were daily life during the war, the participation of the peasants, even the woman carrying food to the fighters. There was a section on fighters dancing during breaks between fighting and relaxing from the war, a very necessary kind of activity. There was a literacy campaign during the war, and this section of the mural portrays it very avidly. Ordinary tasks like baking bread, mending sandals, preparing for war, and last, making trenches, the memory of the war, the actual war itself. So even though the war is over, the war lives on on the walls of Asmara because it's important to keep these memories vivid so that there'll never have to be another war like that again. I'm not the man.